Thanks for joining us. Same words, different worlds. Reaching Roman Catholics with Leonardo de Chirico and Rachel Chiano. Most of us, evangelical pastors, theological colleges, in fact, even the whole of evangelicalism, we have a blind spot when it comes to Roman Catholicism in our theology, our missiology, and our practice. That's what Leonardo de Chirico says. Where do we, as evangelicals, make mistakes in our engagement with the Roman Catholic world? What can we change? Should we change? How do we best see our Roman Catholic friends come to a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Leonardo de Chirico is with us. He's in Australia speaking at the various missionary conferences in January run by the Church Missionary Society. He's been at the forefront of theological education of evangelicals in this space for a decade. He's a church planter, a pastor in Rome, and the director of the Reformanda Initiative. Also with us, Rachel Chiano. She lectures in church history at Sydney Missionary and Bible College and has had a special long-term interest in this space. Leonardo, thanks for coming in. And Rachel, thanks for coming in. Can we start with you and your pastor's heart for the Roman Catholic? I'm Italian and uh, I've been ministering in Italy and in Europe for the whole of my life, uh, meeting uh, thousands of neighbors and uh, uh, colleagues and students, and uh, most of them uh, living, breathing. Uh, Roman Catholicism uh, in their lives and uh, I've seen many of them if not the majority of them lacking a grasp of basic gospel truth mm. couched in a uh, religiosity that oftentimes is uh, obscuring the gospel if not distorting it so it was uh, out of you know, compassion and uh, the desire to see the, the, the gospel shining through in, in people's lives who have been uh, so much influenced by the traditions, uh, the teachings, the practices of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, traveling uh, abroad, I've seen the same uh, challenge uh, uh, globally, it's not just a Italian, European thing. Uh, if you go to Latin America, if you go to many different countries, indeed, throughout the world, that's the same reality. Roman Catholicism, at best, obscures the gospel; at worst, it uh, distorts it. And so, there is a need to feel, you know, the compassion, the desire to for the gospel to will to be clearly presented in its uh, biblical shape and uh, with uh, a, a Christian heart. At best obscures, at worst distorts. You said um, somewhere, I think, um, well, are we dealing with Galatians 1, it's a false gospel, or Philippians 1, it's a true gospel with wrong, faulty motives? What's, what's your take there? Yeah, I think that the as far as the system, Roman Catholicism is a is a system. It's not just a bunch of uh, isolated doctrines and practices, but it's a, a well-crafted uh, theological, um, doctrinal as well as uh, devotional system that shapes uh, whole cultures and adapts to uh, different cultures in order to take a a distinct uh, Catholic uh, form. The system uh, is more of a Galatians 1 um, uh, case that is uh, purposely and uh, intentionally um, it has built not on the uh, on the ground of the of a commitment to scripture alone, Christ alone, but uh, it has been built over the centuries over uh, multiple commitments and uh, in the end leading to something of, of a Galatian type of uh, uh, narrative, mm. gospel plus, that in terms of the gospel itself equals uh, no gospel at all. I mean you can uh, the gospel is uh, made in such a way that if you add something to it, you actually uh, deny deny it, and and uh, come up with a with a different uh, type of gospel. And 
in in terms of individual lives, uh, that is more, I think, the case of a, a Philippians one uh, scenario. There are, of course, individual Catholics who are uh, believers in Christ, but I would say, you know, in spite of their being um, consistent Catholics, and not because they are consistent Catholics, but mm. so they pick and choose, and they're picking and choosing uh, for. Uh, by God's grace, some of them, they focus their lives on Christ alone and uh, they trust Christ alone for their salvation and life. But this is not what the church teaches them to do. They do it in spite of it, not because of it. Mm. I mean, I'm thinking of myself growing up as a Roman Catholic and then understanding grace. And so I'm, I'm agreeing, I'm immediately agreeing with what you've just said. But... Um, I see so many, and I want to bring you in here, Rachel, so many of pastor friends around the place who have been evangelical, grown up in evangelical church, wanting to downplay the differences mm -hmm. between um, Roman Catholicism and evangelicalism. Is, is, do you have that same take and same frustration? Yes, absolutely. So um, in my work at SNBC, training up people for ministry, um, in pastoral work, in Marrickville, with friends and family members, there's a downplaying of the difference. And there's a number of ways that that can happen. Saying we agree on the Nicene Creed, mm -hmm. so that's enough. Saying mm -hmm. we agree on two thirds of the mm -hmm. Roman Catholic Catechism, so that's enough. Um, saying that Rome is moving in a different direction in the last 50, 60, 70 years mm. after Vatican II, that's enough. Looking at uh, evangelical Catholicism, but not understanding what the word evangelical means in that context. It's mm -hmm. not the way that we're using the word at all. So all these things are used, I think, out of a good heart. We would love, we would love them, uh, Catholics, to be saved and sometimes in downplaying the difference it's out of that heart of surely mm. they understand the gospel but actually when you look under the surface at the roots it's it's a very different gospel it's a Galatians 1 mm. gospel and so they need to hear the message of faith alone in Christ alone mm. yeah. so I mean just to pick up on what Rachel just said there Leonardo the same words different meaning you've written extensively on this yeah mm. yeah that is uh, what really happens uh, the vocabulary is the same apart from a few specific Roman Catholic terms uh, introduced uh, in the uh, Catholic tradition you know transubstantiation or uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, these are not biblical words or Christian words, they, these are Catholic words. But as far as, you know, the 90% of the vocabulary is concerned, uh, the words are the same. Sin, grace, cross, Jesus, gospel, salvation, faith, and hope, and we could go on and on and on. The problem is that, uh, that they are meant in a very different way because uh, they are not uh, their meaning is not uh, uh, taken from the Bible as the ultimate authority, the, Bi the ultimate authority and the ultimate interpreted, interpreter of itself. The meaning is uh, uh, the result of an, uh, a complex historical process where uh, with the, biblical me uh, the biblical meaning has been uh, blurred and uh, with other other meanings and not being committed to scripture alone as the ultimate authority, the result is a uh, is a combination of things that uh, uh, for each word. Then, if you put them uh, each word in relationship to the other, the the whole uh, meaning of the of the Christian faith is diverted quite and different. quite different. So it's not only just one word, but it's all the words. Mm. And the result is, uh, a, yes, a, something different. That is. And you're saying you want us to understand this whole, and the whole includes, well, it's the doctrine, it's the institution, it's the history, it's the culture. Mm. It's, it, it's a big project to get your head yeah. around that. Yes, yes. Because that, that's the way in which Catholicism has understood itself over the years, not as a, you know, pick and choose type of religious option, mm. but as an integrated whole. And so it, it is, for us, it is not uh, that we want to see it 
as a whole, you know, from outside, but because Catholicism sees itself as a whole, so it's it's fair to to try to address it in its own terms and having then uh, uh, theological spiritual lenses to to read it and. Um, so doctrinally speaking, it's it's all it's all part of an integrated whole, you know. And yet, Rachel, mm. most individual Roman Catholics are um, pick and choose Catholics or cherry picking mm. Catholics. It's 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 not that they're adopting that whole. They're just kind of mm. how 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 do we do that? How do we engage with them? How do we engage with the, the cherry picking person? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, the average person you meet in Marrickville. Yeah. The average person I meet in Marrickville. So, um, yeah, I do have lots of. Catholic friends and neighbours, mm. family members. Um, and and really your suburb, it, that, it's th that's yeah, your suburb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I try a few things with them. So um, because one of the difficult things uh, in the Catholic system is that it is not founded on scripture alone. Mm -hmm. Scripture is contains the Word of God, but it um, is not all mm. of God's Word. So I'm wanting to try and shift, and it's often very slowly, mm. very prayerfully, their confidence to God's Word. Mm -hmm. So I offer to read the Bible with my Catholic friends, or we'll talk about things. What do you things. do for, which part of the Bible, where do you go? Depends what they want to talk about. So mm -hmm. with uh, some of my friends okay, for whom no, Mary so, and... So, yeah, so yeah. You're, you're a theological college lecturer. You're yes. a genius in this place. Oh, so you, of, course you, of course you flex. But if somebody's watching and think, I don't know exactly what to do, what's your... Oh, what's the, the Bible. What? <laughs> so it's a, so, um, not, not a complex theological argument, but I guess what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to, one, bring their eyes to the Word of God, mm -hmm. To uh, for many um, Roman Catholics, Jesus feels very distant, feels very mm -hmm. far, yeah. which is why he must be accessed through Mary. She mm. has the ear of her son, mm. so approach her and she will bring your requests. So if I can present Jesus as the one who is close by his spirit in believers, mm -hmm. um, then that is very attractive. So, for example, um, uh, with friends who... who are very devoted to, to Mary in their practices, I will take them and I'll tell them the story of the wedding at Cana. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as we talk through that story, I'll say at the end, look, Mary says, listen to my son, mm -hmm. do whatever mm -hmm. he tells you. So I say, if I want to respect Mary, which we do, mm -hmm. yeah. then I need to listen to her. And she tells me to listen to her son. Mm -hmm. um, Mary as well in this uh, system, is protected from original sin in the Immaculate Conception, mm. is uh, bodily assumed as she nears death. So really she's very disconnected to my mm. everyday life mm -hmm. in that system. She mm. doesn't understand the full intensity of temptation to sin. She doesn't understand the full agony of death. Jesus understands both mm -hmm. completely. Yeah. So in my hour of need, I need Jesus. He's mm. so much more attractive. So I think that's what I do. I try and paint in the scriptures the attractiveness of Jesus. And remembering that it's a conversation. It's not me slamming the Bible. Mm. It's, it's a conversation. And the other thing I do with my Catholic friends and, and relatives and neighbours is I pray with them because prayer is often just contained to a set space at a set time for them. So if we're having a conversation, they're sharing something that's difficult in their life, in their very kitchen, I say, can I pray for you now mm. about that? And that is a wonderfully moving experience for them to see faith in action. It's actually deeply theological, because mm. right then and there yeah. we're saying, mm. we have access to the Father, we don't need mm. the hierarchy of the saints. Mm. Um, but it's just that simple task of praying with them in their kitchen um, shows that we can have access to God through Christ. Mm. What do yeah. you teach, Leonardo, as your go-to in terms of um, taking people to the scriptures, the Catholic person? You know? um, yeah, it varies uh, according to you know, context and, and, uh, and situations, but I have found that the Matthew's Gospel is a, um, a gospel that uh, resonates with uh, a, an average Catholic reader, because uh, there we find Jesus 
uh, dealing with uh, the, you know um, Jewish um, audience or, or Jewish context and uh, very much into this uh, view whereby in order to be received by God you, you have to comply with uh, the law of Moses and do good works and so on and so uh, there Jesus uh, speaks about the gospel in terms of him being the new Moses and uh, uh, him being the fulfillment of the law and uh, uh, us having to receive uh, his work uh, and to respond to it. So uh, as far as one gospel is concerned, Matthew uh, seems to be a good place to start a, not an occasional conversation, but a more um, intentional say, series of conversations. Mm. Uh, Leonardo, I've, I've heard you say um, that we evangelicals, we've really dropped the ball in our engagement um, with Roman Catholics, um, that we, we could be doing more, theological colleges should be doing more. Um, this is a major blind spot for us. Can you just give us that, um, that call? Well, <clears throat> there are 1.3 billion Catholics around the world. Uh, we find them everywhere, uh, from north to south, from west to east. And uh, it is the by far the largest uh, religious institution in the world, very much engaged in mission work and cultural work, political work, uh, media, and so on, with its problems and tensions, of course. But uh, it is as if we don't see it. Mm. Uh, we are very much interested in all kinds of different uh, issues, challenges, and topics. And it is right that we should do, we should be interested in all of these topics. But uh, when it comes to the Catholic Church, it is as if we uh, we already know what it is. We uh, it is not. It's out of our radar. And yet, uh, if we don't address it. Uh, intentionally, in a theological, responsible way, uh, the Catholic Church is addressing us, is, is, is uh, trying to uh, posture itself in such a way as to include us in its uh, post-Vatican II attempts at um, embracing, absorbing, uh, attracting uh, evangelicals, but not only evangelicals, into its uh, more suffused um, Catholicity. So you talk about almost, I mean, is, 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 is Catholicism synchronistic? Yes, it is by nature, because Catholicity, Catholic means universal, and uh, the Catholic way of being Catholic is Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it's not syncretism in its pure form, but it's a Catholic type of syncretism. Uh, it's a Roman type of syncretism because it always tries to then put the syncretism into the Roman structures of Roman dogma, Roman uh, hierarchical, um, the, the Roman hierarchical church and so on. And so you find the Latin American Catholicism is syncretistic because it has absorbed the pre-Christian and non-Christian practices and it has put them, them into this Catholic um, Roman uh, shape. The same is true as far as Europe, Africa, Australia. Uh, so it's Catholic syncretistic, but not at the expense of it being Roman. And the genius of Roman Catholicism has always been to maintain the tension between the Roman and the Catholic, the Roman-centered and the syncretistic um, intention, and uh, to maintain the two in a in a in, in, in such a tension as not to break, not to explode, and uh, not to uh, make it a static wooden uh, type of system. It is dynamic, although it is not fluid. It is uh, crafted in such a way as to maintain both the Catholic breath, absorption, syncretism, and the Roman structure centered around uh, the hierarchical principles and uh, 
institutions of the church. Would you say Benedict was more Roman and Francis is more Catholic? Yes, that these are uh, to two, use your terminology. Yeah, yeah. Two, two clear examples of different ways of handling the tension. Mm -hmm. the, the system is not static, so they don't duplicate it, but according to different challenges, different situations and contexts and personalities, and you, you can have a more Roman point of balance or a more Catholic point of balance. Uh, certainly, uh, what we are observing, uh, in, especially with Pope Francis, is, the, is an intentional desire to expand the Catholicity, mm -hmm. uh, not to the point of breaking the Roman uh, aspect. Otherwise, we would have uh, we would have, we would have the end of Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. there, might, there, there could be a time in in the Roman Catholic Church when the, what Pope Francis is doing in pushing the Catholicity will be then need a reverse mm. move towards a more Roman yeah. uh, settlement. And I, I take it that that, um, that memo from George Pell criticizing Francis, as Pell is essentially saying, um, that anonymous memo, um, yeah. come back to Rome, come yeah. back to Rome, yeah. less of this synchronistic Catholicity. Yes, yeah. that's, that's a kind of Catholic prophetic voice wishing that this uh, reverse tide would happen I was now. actually quite surprised at, I mean, even though Pell did it under the guise of anonymity, I was surprised that somebody was prepared to actually say, the Pope is wrong. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, we're used to that in the Anglican Church, but um, we're not used to that in the Catholic Church. Yeah, there have been attempts by other cardinals to, uh, to send uh, the message of a brotherly correction. That's mm -hmm. the technical term. And uh, uh, the Pope never responded to mm. those uh, uh, voices and there have been other voices trying to raise the issue, uh, some issues, but uh, so far they have not received uh, any hearing. Rachel, um, if I'll come back to you and then ask you for your response on this too, Leonardo. Um, uh, I have felt a rebuke the last couple of moments um, on, I mean, in our church we've just had staff planning for the year. Um, we've talked about ministry and reaching out to divorcees. We've talked about reaching out to um, same-sex attractive people. We've talked about reaching out to youth, to kids. You know, we never talked about Roman Catholics in, and yet we don't have as many as you, but we have quite a few. Mm -hmm. And um, what, as a senior pastor, and we've got a lot of senior pastors watching, listening, what strategic things would you be encouraging us to do as we organise our church calendar life together? Let's start with you, Rachel, and then go to you. Mm -hmm. So I would be wanting to encourage all church members to be actively engaging with their communities who do mm. that. And as they do that, they will naturally encounter people from a Roman Catholic mm. background. So um, in inviting those people to church, I think as churches we need to strategically think about the things we're saying, doing, um, visually, what's going on through the eyes of a Catholic person who could join us. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist mm. uh, in the Roman Catholic system uh, is the high point, is the centre mm. of the Christian life. Yeah. Um, and so uh, in order that we're not perceived as a cult of sect, uh, participating in the Lord's Supper regularly uh, gives something of weightiness to our Christian gatherings. Um, I think uh, preaching uh, systematically um, is uh, something that can be very powerful for Catholics because they're often used to verses Bitching, lifted yeah. out yeah. Uh, and like a fourfold reading of scripture that you know can be allegorical and moral and so just as you're preaching what I does it say being, what does it mean what's it I saying I remember being it horrified I read through all the readings on a Sunday in the Roman Catholic lectionary mm -hmm. I don't, know, it was, I don't know whether it was year A, B or C in the mm. lectionary mm. cycle, mm. but I could not find grace mm. in the, the year of readings. And I thought, they have so cherry-picked. Yeah. It was almost, I don't know how you could pick a year of 52 Old Testament, 52 New Testament, 52 yeah. Gospel, and not... <laughs> anyway. yeah. yeah, because the focus is not... Uh, 
is not on grace. The focus is on the, the church administering you what you need to, to hear and to know, and, uh, and so leading you to uh, receiving you know, the sacramental um, grace that the church administers. And so uh, yeah, the Mass doesn't need, uh, in order to be performed, doesn't need a homily technically, mm. but uh, it needs the Eucharist mm. because that is where, and it's not a something that is based on something that you hear, something that you listen to, but it's based on something that you taste and mm. when you see, you watch. There are gestures, there are mm. all kinds of rituals, but the message of grace uh, uh, taught uh, us in scripture and preached to us uh, uh, is not the, the focus, and uh, even the, way, the, the arrangement of, of the readings uh, doesn't, isn't, uh, doesn't seem to be uh, focusing on, on, on grace. Yeah. Mm. Let, let's come back to that question of organizing the church that I just asked Rachel. What's your thoughts on that for, as you plan? I mean, you're a pastor of a church. What do you do to...? Well, for, for us, you know, it, it's, it's not so much uh, in terms of having a specific plan, but to arrange uh, the life of the church uh, in order for it uh, to be a welcoming um, um, church and to be aware of some of the uh, issues that people com coming from a Catholic background might uh, go through. Uh, for example, in preaching, um, as we preach, and they're not used to have long sermons, mm -hmm. you know, a typical homily in the Roman Catholic Church uh, is an eight-minute uh, homily. Mm -hmm. So if we and I think we should uh, have a longer uh, mm. sermon, but we should not presume that people are used to listen to longer sermons. And so, as preachers, we have to be aware. Not, uh, I don't mean we have to restrict our time, but we have to be aware of not overdoing it. And then, uh, as we preach it, uh, it's, okay, it's okay for them to listen to God's Word, but as we preach the Bible, we should find ways to emphasize the finality of Scripture, the fact that this is God's Word, and it's not just a, a you know, divine advice or, or something that is part of that, what the Church tells you to do. It is the Word of God. In order to help them to appreciate the fact that uh, we're dealing with God's Word as our final authority, the, the words of the Lord for us. And also then arrange our church life uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 displaying the fact that we are a community, mm -hmm. we, are, we are a body, we are a family. It's not just a bunch of individual believers uh, happening to come together randomly on a, on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening, but we are a family. That speaks to Catholics uh, more than words in, in, in their initial stages of coming closer to the faith. They see that the gospel shapes communities and not only individuals. They see that the gospel is preached uh, out of the Bible, through the Bible, with the Bible, and not through an external uh, authority, voice, telling you what to do and why. Mm. I was hearing somewhere that the promotion of Mary is at, at the expense of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to just elaborate on that and therefore the faulty doctrine of the Trinity? Yeah, the, the, uh, one of the outcomes of the uh, explosion of Mariology over the centuries has been that the the role of the Holy Spirit has been diminished because as uh, Rachel was saying uh, uh, earlier on in order to approach Christ uh, Mary is the one who helps you to do that but this is exactly what the Holy Spirit mm. uh, does for us uh, bonding us to Christ uh, um, opening uh, for us, uh, you know, the, the relationship with Christ, and so the Spirit was put in a kind of at the, at the margin 
in, on the margin, and Mary became a kind of replacement of the Holy Spirit. And also, not only of the Holy Spirit, but also of Christ Himself, because Christ was then considered to be too high, too divine, too glorious, too distant, too remote, too divine. Mm. And Mary was in, presented as the, the mother, the carer. The, there, there is an interesting sentence, not only by Pope Francis, but Pope Benedict, who is, is often uh, considered as being more you know, biblical, more Christocentric. Mm -hmm. He says uh, in one of, of the interviews he gave to Peter Seewald, the, the German journalist, uh, asking him about his Marian spirituality, and he says, uh, Mary is, uh, Jesus is near. Mary is nearer. That is a, that also as as a, as a Christological a, a huge problem mm. because it's, it's, if Mary is nearer than Jesus, we are actually undermining the full humanity of Jesus, mm. and and we are dismissing the Holy Spirit, making him redundant, and we are undermining the humanity of, of Jesus. So we are dealing with a Trinitarian issue. Mm. not just a Mariological issue. Mm. Just thinking of, in Revelation 1, I believe he's here now standing in our midst. Do you know? Amen. Mm. Thanks so much for coming in. My guests on The Pastor's Heart, Leonardo de Chirico, and uh, he is with the Reformanda Initiative in Rome. He's a church planter over there and uh, has been for a decade a champion in this kind of thinking. And also Rachel Chiano, she lectures in church history at uh, Sydney Missionary and Bible College and pastors at Marrickville Road Anglican Church alongside her husband, Ross. Thanks for joining us on The Pastor's Heart. We will look forward to your company next Tuesday.